ministry at River Oaks, and I am going to read to you our call to worship. So if you would stand where you are, if you would like to, our passage this morning comes from Psalms uh, 110, verses 1 to 3. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Please pray with me. Father God, our holy, sovereign Lord, who has ushered us into yet another new year, we praise you. You alone are worthy of our praise. And we thank you for the gift of your son that we've just celebrated coming to earth in the form of a weak baby. And we thank you that you have given us, Jesus, our true king, who is leading us. Father, help us to submit to our leader, our shepherd king, Jesus. Be with us as we worship him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
be seated. You know, the best thing about being a Christian is knowing that God loves us and has forgiven us. But maybe the worst thing about being a Christian is the fact that our sin sticks around and can make us miserable. And so the way to deal with that second truth is to acknowledge it and to lean back into the first truth. So let's, let's confess our sins together. Oh, Lord God Almighty, you are the creator of all things, the author of history and of each one of our stories. And as we worship today, we crown you with many crowns, recognizing your kingship, your lordship in our lives and in all of creation. We recognize, Father, that your mercies are new every morning. And your great kingdom mission is to make all things new, to bring them back into line with your perfect vision of flourishing in this world. But Lord, we confess our unbelief. When things are going wrong in our lives, we doubt your providential care. When the news we hear seems unremittingly bleak, we begin to think that your mercies and saving power are not a match for the evil that's in the world. And Father, when our sin puts us back at square one, we anoint ourselves, judge and jury and condemn ourselves, believing that we're beyond hope, not worthy of love. Forgive us, Father, remind us of what's true, that you are the only judge, that you declared us not guilty because Jesus already paid the debt for our sins. Work in us as we face this new year to love what is good and to hate what is evil. Give us the spiritual courage to forget what is behind and to press on in the upward call to follow Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Having confessed our sins, please stand and hear this good news from Ephesians chapter 2. That God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. How deep Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He would give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns in. chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my guilt upon his shoulders in anything 
morning. My name is Jonathan Dorst. I'm one of the pastors here at River Oaks and glad to be with you. Sad, very sad that we can't all be together here uh, in person, but uh, glad that so many of you are tuning in from home and with us in spirit. Um, yeah, so our session, which is the group of elders that have been elected by our congregation to lead our church, they've made a guideline that we are essentially following the Tulsa Health Department's recommendations for meeting in person or online. And so we're making sort of a week-by-week -week call. If you, so we have every week on Friday, we send out what we call the Friday update. And, uh, and we let you know not only uh, service times and details, but also what else is going on in the church and different ministries and areas. If you are not on that list, if you are not getting that email, please let me know and I'll add you. Uh, my ad email address is jonathan at riveroakstulsa.com and I would love to add you to that. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about before we get to the sermon is uh, you all know, or hope you know, that uh, our beloved youth pastor, Ross Turner, has... Uh, gone on and taken a pastoral job in Lubbock, Texas, and so he is, is starting that job and is gone from River Oaks, and we're going to greatly miss him, but wanted to let you know that we, uh, we, are, we have not yet hired his replacement. We are still interviewing candidates. We hope to bring someone in very soon, but until we do, uh, I will be acting as kind of a bridge for the youth ministry between Ross and the new person. And, uh, and so if you have questions about the youth ministry, please direct them to me. We will basically be trying to do what, we, what the youth ministry is doing in the fall with uh, friendship groups and one-on-one -on -one mentoring and discipling. Uh, we are also definitely planning to go to camp. So the registration for that will open in uh, February, so we'll get uh, excited for that. Uh, but that's all the announcements, so let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. Oh Lord God, you are our fortress, our strong tower, the giver of new life, our shepherd and our guide. You lead us beside quiet waters, fields of green. Part of the way that you do that, Father, is by bringing us to worship and revealing who you are, giving us a day of rest for our souls, a time of rest as we worship and learn more about who you are, Father. And so as we open up the scriptures this morning, we want to know you deeper. We want to see Jesus that he might be glorified over any man or woman in this world. He is the one who deserves our honor and glory. For he is the one who came to rescue us from the darkness. And Lord, you are with us uh, at all times, but especially as we gather together as your people to read your word and to pray and to sing. And as you sing over us and lead us in the worship of the Father, Lord, we rejoice. So give us ears to hear this morning. Give us hearts uh, to glory in you and to worship you and wills to repent of our sins and to obey you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Justin Rossellino had... A very difficult time his freshman year in college. Uh, he found his classes to be a lot harder than he expected, he missed his high school friends, and he just kind of felt like he didn't fit in in this big university that he was attending. One day he, uh, he made an appointment with a professor in, in whose class he was having a difficult time, and he went to the appointment expecting for the professor to be very busy, kind of remote and aloof like some professors can be. But he was very surprised when he found this professor to not only be attentive, but 
kind and encouraging. And for Justin, it it really kind of changed his college uh, years. In some ways, changed his life as this professor became a mentor to him and as they developed a friendship. And a few years later, he wrote a song about this experience and about this professor called On Your Side. Words go like this. When I remember how first I came to know you, see your life in mine, you stood there before me so open wide as I walked on by. My hands were empty with yearning, but you didn't mind. Could I find a certain friendship in this old man's distant eyes? What would he want from me, the lost apprentice so far, far behind? But he whispered, I'm on your side. And when he listens, he holds me with patience. The humble pupil, he will teach me. And I'll learn the ancient craft called living as I wander through his eyes. And then he'll whisper, stay by my side. I'm on your side. Have you ever had an experience like that? Where someone that you didn't think was going to give you the time of day actually wanted to be your friend, your ally. You know, for a lot of people, the world changes when they approach a God that they think is going to be a stern taskmaster with lots of rules and punishments for their breaking of the rules or not doing enough. And instead, they find a God who says, I'm on your side. In Acts chapter 9, a religious terrorist named Saul Uh, believes that he is on a righteous crusade, a crusade to intimidate, imprison, and murder Christians. And he thinks that he is doing this in service of a God who is angry at those who are breaking his will. But instead, this man Saul finds that the true God is one who has come to rescue people and to give them grace most of all for him. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 9, or you can follow along on the screen behind me. Uh, If you want to stand for this reading, I'll be beginning beginning in Acts 9, uh, the first verse. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. This is God's word for God's people and for the good of the world. Amen. A Damascus Road experience has become an expression for a sudden turning point or a watershed moment in life. And a lot of Christians have asked the question, 
do I have to have an experience as dramatic as Saul's in order to be saved? Right? Because everyone loves a, a very dramatic, good conversion story. But the answer is no. You don't have to have a story as exciting as this. In fact, there are a lot of conversion stories all throughout the New Testament. And uh, in most of them, what happens is simply someone hears the gospel being preached, believes the good news, repents of their sins, and is baptized and welcomed into the church. That's, and that's it, right? And they are just as saved, just as converted as Saul or the Philippian jailer. But this is a great story, isn't it? And there are a lot of interesting angles to this story of Saul's conversion. The first angle uh, we see is God's initiation, his initiative in salvation, right? Because Saul is not looking for Jesus, is he? He's not... He's not looking for the truth. He thinks he has the truth. He's, he's not looking to, be, to change, to become a Christian. He's trying to kill Christians, wipe them out. But God has other plans, and he dramatically stops Saul in his tracks. And of course, Saul goes on to become the Apostle Paul, who would write nearly half of the, the books of the New Testament and become the chief church planter and evangelist in the New Testament. The second th interesting thing about this story, I think, is how Saul's calling, or Paul's calling, really, is given at the same time as his conversion. All right, in verses 15 and 16, God says, He will carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I'll show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. God is basically revealing to Ananias Paul's calling, that he's going to be a preacher, and he's going to preach to Gentiles, and, and he's going to suffer for his role. And th this isn't normal, standard, right? God doesn't typically reveal our calling when we become Christians. Typically what happens is we, we go through a process of learning the faith, Right? learning the scriptures, being discipled, and then uh, figuring, trying to figure out what our spiritual, unique spiritual gifts may be, and then what our calling in the church and the world might be. And a lot of times that involves trial and error. But for Paul, he, he really gets it pretty much up front. Here's your calling. The third interesting thing in this story, though, is Ananias' courage. Right? Here's, here's a Christian following the way, as it's called. And God tells him to go meet with his greatest enemy. Ananias knew all about who Saul was and what he was planning to do if he caught him. This, is, this would be a little bit like if someone uh, told a Jewish man during World War II to go and meet with Hitler or Hermann uh, Goering, right? Because they've had a change of heart, and they, they're on your side now. That'd be a tough ask. And yet, Ananias goes because God calls him, tells him to go. And Ananias welcomes Paul, and then he helps disciple him, and really discipling the, the, probably the greatest theologian in church history. Ananias plays a, a, a big part here. But, you know, there's, there's so many interesting angles, a lot of other things that we could talk about in this story. But the thing that I have been thinking a lot about and that we're going to want to focus on this morning is Jesus' first words to Saul when he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, when you think about that question, <laughs> because it, it, it begs another question, doesn't it? Which is, how? How, how could it, Saul be persecuting Jesus? And after all, this is well after the ascension when Jesus went into heaven 
and went to sit and to rule and reign at the right hand of God. And as far as we know, Saul had never met Jesus, and at this point he couldn't see him or touch him, right? And yet Jesus says, you're persecuting me. How, how is that possible? Well, the answer, of course, is that Saul is persecuting the church. And Jesus is identifying with his people. He's saying, if you hurt them, you are hurting me. Think about that. Think about how incredible that is. That Jesus is, is saying there's no discernible distance between them and him. Right? This is, this is a lot more than just, you know, I'll be there for you. Or, you know, if you need help, call me. Right? This is Jesus saying, I am a part of you. What happens to you happens to me. In fact, Paul would become the chief teacher of something known as union with Christ, which is the, the great truth that we are united to Christ by faith when we become Christians. From the moment of our conversion till forever, actually, we we are in union with Jesus, he is, which means he is always in us and we are always in him. We are never apart from him. Like Jesus talked about this in his earthly ministry. He said, abide in me and I will abide in you. Now, what does that mean, practically speaking, right? This big doctrine of union with Christ. There are a thousand applications that we could make, but Let's just talk about two things right now. First thing it means is that Jesus hurts when we hurt, right? You know, whenever a tragedy happens like 9-11 or the Joplin tornado, inevitably people ask the question, where was God when that happened? And the answer is, well, we don't know why he allowed it to happen, but the answer where he is is he was there. He was there with his people, suffering when they suffer, hurting when they hurt. Jesus is with the woman whose, wife, whose husband is beating her. Jesus is with the scared little boy in the foster system. And Jesus was with you through all the difficult moments, the hard times of this past year. He hurts when you hurt. The second application of union with Christ, though, is that Jesus is with us in our fight against sin. Right? He's not against us. He's, he's fighting for us. Too often when we have messed up in a big way and we're, we're dealing with the consequences of our sin, we kind of revert back to trying to to fix it all ourselves, don't we? Right? We, we see God as, as far away, and, and if we would just stop sinning and get better, then maybe we could make up the distance between him, make him like us again. You know, we kind of see God like Darth Vader, right? Like perpetually disappointed in his underlings, ready to do that cosmic chokehold. I find your lack of faith disturbing. That is not... God. That is not Jesus. He is with you, even when you sin. Now, there may be, you know, we may feel relational distance from God, but there is no true spiritual distance from God. We, and we were, uh, you know, Romans 7 says this, it says, if Christ is in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. In other words, if, God, if Christ is in you, he will give you life. He will help you fight sin. He will help you do good works. It's the good works he's prepared for you to do. And we were never meant to try to fight sin on our own. It's, it's God who gives us the strength to fight. It's God who gives us and promises that there will be a way out. From temptation. Those are some of the things it means to have union with Christ. But this union with Christ also means this, and this is our second point, that 
that Jesus is protective of his people. All right, again, Jesus' question to Paul shows whose side he's on, who he's going to protect. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, the book of Revelation takes this a step further. In fact, our call to worship, Psalm 110, talks about this as well. Um, so the, because the book of Revelation was written to first century Christians who were being persecuted, not only by the chief priests and Pharisees, but by the, the Roman government and the emperors who were you know, taking them to the Colosseum and feeding them to lions. And in Revelation 16, an angel from heaven praises Jesus saying this. Listen to this. He says, Just and true are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. This is an angel of heaven. The, listen, this is one of the main themes of the book of Revelation that we should take heart even when we are in the midst of great trials and persecutions. Because Jesus will ultimately make things right. He will ultimately avenge any mistreatment done to his people. Jesus is on the side of those who are part of his body. And the reverse of that statement is also true. That if you're not a part of his body, Jesus is against you. He makes that very clear in Luke 11 when he says, whoever is not with me is against me. Now, listen. When we talk about persecution and Jesus' protection and retribution, we, need to, we probably need to differentiate between, at least here in America, right, what is real persecution and what is maybe not real persecution, right? Because I think we do great injury and insult to Christians around the world who are being arrested, tortured, and even killed for their faith. When we cry persecution, we're sort of at the drop of a hat. And so what is real persecution? Right? It, it does happen, right? Real persecution might look like this when someone in your group of friends makes fun of you for being a Christian and, and not joining in when everybody's passing around a joint or a flask or uh, pictures you shouldn't be looking at. That, that's real persecution. What maybe is not real persecution is when a store clerk says happy holidays to you. Right? I mean, recognizing we live in a plural society with many faiths, many different holy days, is not a threat to us, uh, to, to, be, to us being able to practice our faith. It may be a sign that our society is changing yet, but probably not real persecution. Real persecution might look like this. A qualified professor being denied tenure because her colleagues found out that the church she goes to have beliefs that they feel are terrible and backwards. What's probably not real persecution is when the city mandates masks be worn inside all public places, including churches, right? Now, yes, there have probably been instances over the last year of government overreach, uh, but as long as the government is not telling us what to believe or practice or denying our right to worship, it's probably not persecution. Now, Yes, it's possible that for a variety of reasons, religious liberty in America may be diminished in coming years. Persecution of Christians may be on the rise. I don't know. But listen to this. Hear me when I say that our hope is not that America will be an easy, it will continue to be an easy or a comfortable place for Christians to live or to practice their faith. Our hope is that Jesus is with us through whatever trials we face, whatever persecutions might come, and that he will eventually deliver us from our enemies. Right? Jesus, he promised that we would face persecution. 
And in Matthew 5, he even says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. This is blessed are you when that happens. Acts 9 proves that he is with us even in the worst of our circumstances. He's on our side. But what does it mean to be on Jesus' side? Because being on Jesus' side has some specifics. And the first specific, really the big specific thing it means is that for you is that there is a place for you, and that is a local church. Membership in a local church. Why is that? Well, because the church is the body of Christ, and you, you can't be a part of Christ if you're not part of his body, right? The church is is Jesus' bride, the Bible says, and you can't really love Jesus if you despise his bride. What does Saul do after his conversion? He gets baptized, and he joins the church. Right? That's, that's the first thing he does. It's become very popular in our day to say, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. You know, I love God, I like Jesus, but I, I, I don't go to church. Listen, if that is you, I have some maybe disturbing news for you. Because in Matthew 16, when Jesus sets up his church with his disciples, he gives them some keys, right? Right after he tells them, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he tells his disciples, who are the, going to be the leaders of the church, right? The, the, the foundation, the apostles of the church. He tells them, he gives them the keys of the kingdom. He says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, the church has the privilege and the responsibility to, in a sense, open up heaven, open the gate to heaven for some people and to close it to others. And you say, whoa, Jesus did what? I know. That is pretty incredible that he gave us that kind of power and authority as a church. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that everything that every church does is perfect or authoritative, but it does mean that when we baptize someone into the church, into the covenant community, or when we admit them to the Lord's table into communion with Christ and with his people, those actions have eternal ramifications, right? Jesus is not playing around with his sacraments or with his church. He is very serious about them. And as we follow Christ and are faithful to his word, we are ministering in his name and acting for him. And listen, the church is not just about me and, and Ricky. And, and Caroline and the other staff members doing ministry. It is so much bigger than that. New Testament calls the church a body with every member, every single person in the church, a part, a different part of that body. And, and part of being a biblical and strong and robust church is every person finding out what part they play in the body of Christ. Some of you know that my, my dad is a pastor, like me. He takes after me. Um, and when I was four years old, my family was in a terrible car accident. And my mother took the brunt of the accident. She was in a coma for three weeks, and then she was in a rehab hospital for a month after that. And during those seven weeks, my dad had three little boys, and uh, the church 
where we, he was a youth pastor, we were members, sprang into action. Uh, members of the church made lunch and dinner for us every day. Uh, girls in the youth group babysat me and my two little brothers. Uh, boys in the youth group mowed our yard, and their moms di did our laundry, cleaned the house. And my dad has said that he does not know how he would have gotten through that time if it hadn't been for the body of Christ. Right? You need the church, and the church needs you. And listen, I know some of you are saying, yeah, I know. I miss being here. Why don't you give me a paper cut and pour lemon juice in it, right? We've missed being together. But as we look ahead to this coming year and the time when we no longer have to shelter in place or wear masks, I want to ask you, are you excited about the church coming back together? Or have you maybe grown ambivalent about it? You know, I think maybe what is happening in this time is what has probably been happening and maybe it's speeding up and uh, in a sort of losing what we, what we call cultural Christianity, what Tim Keller calls the mushy middle, those who are maybe sort of on the fence or just Christians in name only, go to church because it's kind of popular. And I think there are a lot of people who are on the fence about either their, their faith in Christ or their commitment to the church. And in this year... They're going to either jump off and never come back or jump into a more meaningful relationship with God and his church. Now, a lot of us have done our best to try to keep in touch with each other, and I'm so grateful for so many of you who've kept in touch with each other, prayed for each other through these difficult years. I'm, I'm thankful for my community group leaders who've had to get creative about finding places and spaces to meet together, keeping in touch. Uh, and I'm thankful for technology, that we can still communicate, that we can do this worship live stream. But it's, it's not the same, right? Scott McKnight, he says this. He says, the church, yeah, it can communicate conveniently and quickly in digital formats like e-newsletters. But we can't really get to know one another apart from embodied realities, you can't really do church fully digitally. The important things about church life are all embodied. Knowing one another, loving one another, sitting and standing and praying with one another, listening to the sermon, watching the tone of the words, the movement of the body when we sing and walk forward and take communion. These are the things that make a church a church. Brothers and sisters, let's make it a goal to be back together as soon as possible and in each other's lives in 2021. Let's be on each other's sides because Jesus is on our side. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you that you have not left us alone, that you have sent your Holy Spirit to indwell us that Christ is with us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit at all times. And Father, we thank you for that perpetual union with him. How we find our lives in the greater story of Jesus' life and how he has embedded himself in our lives and so that he is a part of us and feels what we feel. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we're grateful for your love for us. Father, we pray for this year ahead as we struggle to stay connected, as we struggle to believe the promises of God that you would strengthen our faith, that you would help us and give us the courage and the, the well-being to be able to help those who are in need to reach out beyond our own homes and even beyond our own church to be your hands and feet in the world. And Father, keep us united on mission with our Savior King Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as
As you know, if you were here this fall, um, or tuning in this fall, we did a, uh, our 2020 Christmas offering, which is to benefit New City Fellowship, our, one of our church plants in, in Tulsa, here in Tulsa, uh, to help them buy a building, and also uh, for RUF, Reformed University Fellowship at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, I found out this morning we have a preliminary total, which will probably get updated this week, but the preliminary total blew me away. It's $108,000 that you gave to that Christmas offering, which is pretty phenomenal. And uh, we are so grateful for your generosity and uh, thank you for it. So let's sing these closing songs. This first song is just a wonderful song about what the church is and how its foundation is none other than Jesus. Let's stand and sing.
fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace And fears are stilled when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ Light of the world by darkness slain, bursting for glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, his curse has lost its grip. receive these good words as we go out from here. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. To him be glory in Christ Jesus and in the church throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen.